Good evening, everyone. I'm PJ O'Neill, serving as Branch Chief for STEM Training in Youth Programs. Thank you for joining this month's Coast Guard Tech Talk. And Tech Talks are held on the fourth Tuesday of each month at 2100 Eastern and are sponsored by the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary and the Boy Scouts of America Sea Scout Program. We will take questions at the end of the Tech Talk, but feel free to post them in the chat at any time. This is a reminder that this Tech Talk is being recorded and will be uploaded to both the Aux Scout and Sea Scout YouTube channels. The recorded Tech Talks make excellent training opportunities for a ship, a flotilla, or just to rewatch the material. Tonight's Tech Talk is pad Paddling Hazards, which is going to be a two-part series. So part two will continue next month on September 27th. A little bit about our subject matter expert tonight. Uh, Dr. Robert, Robin Pope has been Pope, sorry, Dr. Robin Pope has been involved in boating for over 40 years um, and started off as a sailing instructor and lifeguarding, but for more than the, more than 30 years, his primary focus has been paddling. Served as the chair of the American Canoe Association's Board of Directors and as division chief for the U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary's Paddlecraft Safety Division and holds the American Canoe Association's highest instructor ratings in swift water rescue and whitewater kayak. He's helped establish national education standards for boating and works with a number of state and national groups to address paddling and boating safety issues. He's also a, contribu a contributing author for the latest edition of the Sea Scout Manual, the Kayaking Merit Badge Pamphlet, and the Whitewater Merit ba Badge Pamphlet and served in a wide range of scouting leadership roles. So I'm very excited for our talk tonight on paddling hazards, and I'd like to hand it over to Robin. PJ, thank you very much for that introduction, and uh, I look forward to speaking with everyone tonight. Um, PJ, I just want to confirm that, that my screen is being shared now. Everybody Correct. can see that? Yep, good Excellent. to go. Great. And great. So, the talk tonight is going to focus on paddlecraft, individual and tandem vessels, canoes, kayaks, and stand-up paddle boards. Um, but what I talk about will be relevant to uh, multi-person craft such as rafts and rowboats. Um, and I also want to point out that paddlers are boaters. So whether you're a paddler, a power boater, a sailor, or some combination of, of all of those, everything that we talk about tonight is going to be relevant to you. I want to start with some background information. In 2020, about 25 million, perhaps more people, paddled a canoe, kayak, or stand-up paddleboard in the U.S. And that means that there were roughly 20 million vessel captains, perhaps more. If we look at data between 2010 and 2019, on average, we look at all boaters and all types of boats, there were about 648 fatalities each year, and about 21% of those were paddlers, or year-to-year -year range of 16 to 24%. If we look at 136 deaths per 25 million people, the data shows that paddling is generally a very safe activity, something that we should all be involved in. If we dive a little deeper into the data, though, we see that there's some tragedies in those numbers. Uh, we know that most boating deaths and most paddling deaths result from drowning. Uh, we know that most deaths are associated with unexpected entry into the water, falling overboard and capsizing, but nearly 10% involve voluntarily leaving a boat. So jumping into the water for someone who uh, either doesn't know how to swim or the water is colder than they expect or some other problem. And with those numbers, it's not surprising that most drowning subjects aren't wearing a life jacket. The tragedy here is that nearly every boating death is preventable. Uh, and the question we have to ask is why shouldn't we take some easy evidence-based steps to prevent those deaths? And that's really what this talk tonight is about. How do we make sure that people have more fun on the water uh, and uh, have a better time? Uh, so why bother listening to this presentation? Uh, I think anybody listening to this would, in, would agree that boating is fun. We do it because we enjoy ourselves. And whether we're enjoying ourselves because it's fun to be out on the water with friends or because we are having a professional experience teaching people or taking classes, whether we're out competing, it comes down to we go boat because we enjoy it. And enjoying it is way more fun than dealing with catastrophes and tragedies. 
The Coast Guard's motto is Semper Paratus, always ready. And the scouting motto is be prepared. We should be ready and prepared to deal with problems. And the best preparation is preventing problems in the first place. So in the talk tonight, I'm going to introduce an accident or an adverse event management model. That's a very simple way of looking at things. We're going to expand it a little bit, talking about an accident timeline that I've presented to this community before, uh, but is worth a quick review. And then we're going to look at some specific hazards, prevention techniques, and management techniques, and then I'll be happy to answer any questions. So how do we manage accidents? How do we deal with adverse events? The first goal is to identify potential problems before they happen and take some steps to prevent them. If we can identify a problem, uh, for example, the water is cold, so we put on warm clothes and big steps to not capsize and enter the water. We've dealt with that problem without any, any further issues. The next thing we do is manage the events when they happen. So somebody does capsize, they fall in the water, we need to know how to get them back in their boat, get them out of the water and get them to safety. And then we do what we can to fix the problem afterwards. So that person is in the water, we've gotten them back out, now they're bitterly cold. We need to know how to warm them back up, make sure that we can take care of any worse problems. Um, and then perhaps the most important thing after the event has happened is don't waste our misfortune and mistakes. Something bad has happened, let's take some steps and learn from it so that those mistakes don't happen again. And the mistakes that we're going to talk about tonight are going to give us all an opportunity to learn from other people's misfortunes. One way to look at this is to think about an accident timeline and look at steps we can take to prevent the problem beforehand and then deal with the problem afterwards. And long before an accident occurs, days to decades, we don't know where the accident's going to happen, we don't know who it's going to happen to, and we don't know when it's going to happen. And even within that big void of area, void of knowledge, we can do some things to prevent problems and deal with them. We do that by developing overall knowledge, skills, abilities, and attitudes. The attitude of trying to better ourselves, make sure that we are better prepared, that we're always ready, is going to help deal with whatever comes up. The next phase is the before phase. And that could be minutes to months beforehand. That's when we've decided where we're going and roughly when we're going. And we start to get a feel for who is going to be on the trip with us. To prevent problems there, we start working at developing site-specific knowledge. So knowing hazards that are specific to the waterway, uh, knowing the environmental hazards that we expect to deal with, whether that's weather conditions, water levels, or just temperature. Uh, a trip in January in uh, Western North Carolina, where I live, has different requirements than a trip in August, just because the, the weather is different and the temperature is different. Because we know who we're going to be with, we can also look at our group and what type of skills our group brings, what type of limitations our group might have, uh, what type of knowledge they need to have to, to safely and uh, enjoyably get on the trip. Uh, we also start looking at equipment. So a multi-day trip might require different equipment than a single day trip. Uh, a more remote trip might require things that are different than a short trip on a lake that's roadside. But knowing that, that equipment needs are and uh, making sure that it's available and that everyone in the group knows how to use it will help prevent problems. The final before phase is just before the accident occurs, and this is just hazard recognition. And it can be things that are very obvious. If we have a hurricane that's forecast to come through, perhaps we should not go paddling. Uh, it might be waking up in the morning and realizing that the temperature is much colder than we expected or that the wind is much stronger than we expected and either postponing or doing something else or going to another waterway. It might be going down the water and realizing that there is a hazard immediately in front of us and recognizing that hazard and taking steps to maneuver our boat around it. Um, whether we're in a power boat or a, a paddle craft, you know, noticing that there is debris in the water and making sure we don't hit it is going to make sure that we have a safer and more enjoyable experience. If none of these work and an accident happens, we have three phases afterwards. And the first phase is a self-rescue phase. Um, that's critical. The best rescue is self-rescue and prevention is the best self-rescue. So we try to prevent it when we can't, we wanna rescue ourselves. If we're not able to do that, 
hopefully we have a group with us and as, as scouts and as auxiliary members, we, we really should not ever be on the water by ourselves um, because we need that group to take care of us just as we would take care of people in our group. If you can't rescue yourself and your group can't rescue you, we then move into the long after phase. And that's when we have rescue by others outside our group. That's what happens when someone calls the auxiliary for help. Uh, and it's when we call for professional rescue. So with that as an introduction, let's look at some specific common paddling hazards and some things we can do to prevent problems with them and then ways to manage them if they do happen. Uh, and I'm gonna look at hazards involving our bodies, water in our boats, the way that we interact with water, weather, things in the water, water features specifically, uh, and then we're, we're gonna look at other people and craft and wrap up with transportation. So hazards that we deal with with our bodies, anybody that's been on the water for a long time knows that we get sunburned, we get dehydrated, and we get musculoskeletal injuries, uh, ranging from sore muscles to dislocated shoulders. So take care of yourselves. To prevent this problem, we've identified it. So use sunblock, use protective clothing to prevent sunburn, wear a hat. Uh, dehydration, make sure that we're drinking plenty of fluid, look at our urine output, make sure that we are, are taking care of ourselves and drinking that fluid before we uh, start having any adverse effects. And then for musculoskeletal injuries, make sure that we are going out and doing the, the training that we need to do a long trip. We want to start with shorter trips uh, rather than going out for a, a, a 10 mile paddle the first time we're on the water. Uh, not only is it safer to, to start with shorter trips and build up the experience, but it's also more fun. Uh, we don't want to take a new scout or a, a new uh, potential OxPad operator and put them on the water, do a much longer trip than they're prepared for, and have them walk away and never come back to paddling. So take care of yourself, take care of your team. We're going to look at some water hazards. And pretty clearly water has some significant hazards. We can't breathe water. So once we're in it, we have some challenges, but water moves our boat, which makes us more likely to enter the water. And then because water is not stable, once we're in the water, getting back in our boat can be a challenge. So how do we deal with this? How do we prevent it? And the first is take some training and learn some boat handling skills. Uh, you can see Parker sitting here learning uh, some forward strokes and uh, learning how to navigate down an easy river. We also want to choose appropriate venues. Uh, so this was my Sea Scout ship on a, a large lake. And you can look at the water and you can tell that the water is calm. There's not a whole lot of wind and uh, there wasn't a lot of boat traffic. So this was a great opportunity to introduce people to a longer paddle uh, and give them an opportunity to have fun and, and practice some skills. We want to recognize that there are a lot of features on the water and, and we could spend all night talking about different features of, of uh, water on lakes and oceans and rivers. But the fundamental thing we want to recognize is that many of these features can be fun. It's fun to get in the waves at the beach. It's fun to get into waves and hydraulics on rivers, but sometimes it's not. And the, uh, the paddler you can see here, I'm not sure which river this is, um, but I'm not sure I would be having fun there. That looks a little bit more exciting than I'd like to have. And I suspect that they're, they're um, pretty concerned about what they're gonna flush into. So learn to tell the differences between what's fun and what's not, and recognize that what's fun for one person at a certain skill level is not necessarily what's fun for someone else. When we're in a leadership role, the same as if we're going out hiking, we, uh, we set our pace to the slowest person. We want to set our fun level on challenging water to the person who is least experienced to make sure that everybody has an enjoyable opportunity. Having said that, we want to recognize that things do happen. And we can see a pinned kayak here. And if you look closely, you can see that there's a person pinned downstream. Uh, we can see on the cursor, that's actually a, the person's hand right there. His helmet is right there. Uh, this is not a real scene. This is a scenario that we set up for training as people took training to learn how to deal with this. And you can see a group here learning how to get people across a, a rapid channel using ropes so that they might access somebody who is pinned in a boat. Recognize that bad things do happen. We want to take the training in advance to deal with it so that we learn in a controlled setting instead of trying to figure it out when bad things have occurred. 
one of the big things that's going to happen is that you're going to capsize. Capsizing is part of paddling. So learn what to do. And we can see Lloyd here about to, to enter the water and he is uh, already exiting the boat. Once you're out of the boat, it's important to be comfortable in the water. And there's a reason that scouts have a swimming requirement as part of paddling requirements. We want to be comfortable when we get in the water. One reason that these people are comfortable in the water right now, if you look closely, you can see that some of them have bright green things on. Those are their life jackets. They don't have to worry about floating. And you can see that this person over here, um, you can just see their feet by the, the boat. Uh, they're in short, excuse me, didn't mean to go back there. They're in shorts. Uh, the water is warm, so we've chosen a venue where they're comfortable in the water and they can worry about other skills uh, and still have a good time. Dealing with the capsize, there are lots of opportunities, particularly in kayaks and canoes. Uh, you can learn how to roll your boat up, and the, the person in the orange boat here is learning how to do an Eskimo roll so that they can right their boat once it's upside down without any trouble. Um, or you can use help from a friend, and the, the gentleman in the blue and orange boat is using the, the boat, the purple boat, as a way to brace himself and come up out of the water. We want to learn how to empty your boat. Um, once the boat's in, upside down, it's going to be full of water, and you can see the group here emptying the boat and getting ready for re-entry. And the re-entry on the other side, uh, you can see me climbing back up over the, the back deck of my boat, getting, in the, uh, getting back into it after a capsize. It's easy to talk about those things, but what I'd like to do is take a moment and show you what it actually looks like. So we're going to show some videos, and I'm just going to narrate through this. So this is a, a young scout from ship 957 who uh, just capsized because I told him to. And he's going to figure out how to get his boat empty of water. You'll notice that he's taking his paddle and getting it to me. He's then bringing his boat to me so I can help him. And I'll point out this was filmed during COVID. So I'm masked. Parker's in the water. He can't be wearing a mask. I'm putting my paddle down between the boats, and then we're going to see what happens if I don't pay attention to them. The person in the water is swimming to the back of the boat and pushing down, which makes it easier for me to lift the boat up onto mine. We pull it over. Now, this boat didn't have any type of internal bulkhead and didn't have any internal flotation, so it's full of water. So the swimmer has gone underwater to try and up. He's going to try that a couple times. And then he's going to swim to the other side. So he's going to swim to the other side and pull down to help empty the boat. The boat that he was paddling weighs a about 600 pounds when it's full of water. It's about an 80 gallon vessel. Uh, it's got about eight pounds per gallon of water. So about 600, 650 pounds of water there. Um, so it takes a few minutes to get all that out. But as we rock it back and forth, you'll notice that our paddles have drifted off. Uh, one of the people in our group has come over to get those paddles to make sure they don't drift away. And after we've got the boat empty, we flip it over, and then we're going to be ready to get back in. A few key things from that video. One, this is something that's hard to do by yourself. Paddling as a group is, is a critical safety issue. Um, two, the two of us working on his boat were not paying attention to our paddles, and that was okay where we were. Uh, we would have done some other things if the water was rougher, but because we had some other people in our group, we didn't even have to worry about that. The, the third person in our group went and got the paddles, and we were able to get them without any difficulty. So, so the boat's upright. We have to get back in. So I'm gonna hold on to the boat. You can see Parker climbing up over the stern. Much, much easier to do this if you've got a friend to stabilize the boat. He's going to drop his feet in. Gets all his gear clear, and he drops down. So it took, between capsize and righting the vessel, it took about two minutes to get the boat empty. And then here it took about another 20 seconds to get back in the boat. So taking a boat that's completely full of water, emptying and re-entering in less than three minutes.
What we just saw does require some, some physical strength and some, some good balance. So there's another way we can do this. We'll show that. This is a rescue called a heel hook rescue. And Parker has never done this. So he's getting coached through it. Generally, it works best if bow, to, uh, bow is set to stern. He's gonna lay on his back. So his feet are pointing towards the bow. His outside leg comes up into the boat. So his left leg is now on the left side or port side of the boat. He's gonna reach over and grab onto his boat. And then I'm gonna help him find his positioning. And he's gonna just roll up into the boat. You can see that he's using his leg muscles to help climb in. He's really grabbing whatever he needs to. Physically, this is a lot easier than the first technique you saw. And once he's up on the back deck, he's just gonna roll, slip first, but then he's gonna roll. And he's seated and ready to go. And that took less than a minute for him to get back in. And that's the first time he had ever done that. So with a little practice, it would have gone a lot faster. Take home message here is that we are gonna capsize. We need to know how to deal with it. What we just saw here can be done in a canoe. Um, on a stand-up paddleboard, it's even easier. Just climb up on the deck. Some other hazards we need to be aware of. Uh, water's cold, so dress to swim. Uh, water less than 70 Fahrenheit is considered cold. And the colder the water, the more rapid the onset of problems and the more problems you're likely to encounter. And next month, we'll talk about that in depth. Just to put a little reference on some conditions that people do paddle, you'll notice that these people are all in dry suits and you can see some white streaks coming by. That's because it was 37 degrees and snowing when this picture was taken. Uh, this was part of a rescue class and these were some highly motivated students uh, that wanted to be prepared for worst case situations. And everybody that's been listening to this talk has been waiting for this slide because uh, I haven't mentioned life jackets yet, and they are a critical thing. Uh, every boater that you've seen in every picture so far has been wearing a life jacket because they are a critical safety thing. Life jackets provide flotation and warmth, and they can provide storage and visibility. And the data shows that about two thirds of boating deaths could be prevented through consistent life jacket wear. So wear your life jacket every time you boat. Some of the life jackets up here really do some other things. This nice, uh, bright green life jacket, the bright orange life jackets make it much easier to be seen on the water. And we'll talk about that more in a little bit. Weather, weather is a significant hazard and it's something that we best deal with through prevention. Uh, we'll see a nice lightning strike here. We don't wanna be anywhere near that when we're on the water. So lightning and boating don't mix. When the weather forecast calls for thunderstorms, it's a good time to do something else. We know that if we hear thunder, lightning is close by. We want to be off the water for 30 minutes between the time uh, when we see, excuse me, 30 minutes past the last time we see lightning or hear thunder. And we want to get off the water as soon as we see lightning or hear thunder. Lightning often is associated with thunderstorms and thunderstorms are going to have wind, but even calm days can be a challenge. A gentle wind blowing offshore can drive you away from safety surprisingly fast. Now, a five or six knot wind can get you to a point where it's hard to get back to shore faster than you expect. And a gentle wind blowing in an unsafe direction may be much less safe than a strong 10 or 20 knot wind that's blowing us onto shore and when we have a problem is putting us towards safety. So always check your weather forecast and have backup plans. Um, and that backup plan might be going to a different waterway. It might be waiting for the weather to change. Uh, it might be putting on earlier in the day. So we know at the coast, winds are often stronger in the morning, or excuse me, stronger in the afternoon. Uh, we might plan to go boating in the morning and be off the water by the time the winds pick up. But all of this is about knowing what the weather is gonna do and taking preparation so that we don't have to deal with adverse events. We're on the water and water can come from uh, rainfall. So remember that flooding does come from heavy rainfall. Uh, look for that to occur and be prepared for changes in water level even once you're on the water, particularly in rivers. Um, hopefully everybody realizes that when we see cars floating downstream, we probably should not. 
but what happens if we were paddling down this river and the water started coming up? Um, we know that when the water changes color, when it starts getting muddier, when the levels are rising suddenly, that's evidence of uh, flash flooding. And the best place for a paddler to be in a flash flood is on land. Uh, so having some backup plans, knowing our exit routes before we get on the water so that we can take care of ourselves is the way to go. Rain and uh, lightning are often associated with wind and we can't see wind, but we can see the waves it creates and we can see some fairly large waves here. So be sure to check your weather forecast and if you're in a surf area, check for your wave forecast. You can Google surf conditions, Google weather and Google river levels to, to get local conditions. Uh, check your local guidebooks, outfitter websites so that you know what good conditions are supposed to be, particularly if you're new to an area. And let's look at some things in the water. So we've dealt with weather, we've dealt with, with uh, the water itself. Let's look at some features. And the first feature is a low head dam. Uh, this is something we see on a lot of rivers and it looks fairly benign. It's not a big drop, but the challenge is that water flows off of the, the upstream portion across the drop and then hits the bottom and recirculates. And this blue line shows about the depth of the, the backwash. So water here is going back into the dam. If we're in the water with that, we tend to get recirculated back into the dam. So the best way to deal with this, really the only safe way to deal with something like this is to walk around it. One of the big challenges here, the thing that makes it even less safe than, than uh, you might think at first glance, is not only is water recirculating, but often there are man-made structures. Almost always there are man-made structures on the side that keep you from exiting. Natural features don't have, generally don't have this. They're much easier to get out of, but these man-made features will prevent you from exiting from the sides of these hydraulics. And that's best seen if we take a look at a video. So I'm gonna run this and we're gonna stop it in just a second. So if we take a look at the water level here, if we follow the cursor, you can see that it actually drops down. And this is the area for the boil line. I'm gonna start the video again in just a moment. I want you to look for water from here flowing back into the dam. You can see, particularly right in here, Water is coming out, going downstream, and water is coming up and going back into the dam. You can see that throughout the, the uh, backwash. Run that again. You know, water is coming back into the dam through here. If you were in that, in a boat, you would keep going back into the dam. Uh, so we want to make sure that anytime we see these low head dams that we walk around them. Another feature we see in the water, um, in rivers in particular, are strainers. And strainers are anything that lets water go through but doesn't let you, your boat, or your gear go through. And they're often created by trees that fall into the river. Rocks can also create uh, strainers, what we call sieves, uh, which are essentially rocky strainers. Um, and the goal here is to stay away from them. This strainer is in a slow moving river. It doesn't look very intimidating. It's easy to look at this and think, oh, I, that won't be a problem. So let's look at a bigger strainer. And here we can see a bridge with all sorts of debris and water flowing into it. And if you take a close look down at the, find my cursor. Uh, if you take a close look down here, that's a boat. That's somebody's kayak and it's these people. So that gives you some scale here. These people were, were bo presumably boating downstream. Their got, boat got stuck into the strainer and uh, they had a bad day. So let's make sure that when we see these type of features, we realize that they might appear to be something to paddle towards. They look solid, um, but they let water go through and they don't let us go through. So they create a real challenge. The best way to deal with them is not to deal with them at all and walk around them or paddle around them. Let's look at some things that we see in the water uh, and power boats and other people are a big thing here. Uh, remember that power boats travel fast, abandoned fishing gear in the water can catch you and other people may just not be paying attention. They may not see you and that can create challenges and hazards. So assume that other people don't see you. If we're on a lake or on the ocean, 
power boats are a clear hazard. We can see that if you were on a watch on the boat here, it might be difficult to see a paddler. And if you're moving at 20 or 30 knots, you might be on a paddler very quickly, even if you did see them. So we want to make sure that, that we are looking out for power boats uh, because they're not always looking out for us. We also want to recognize that even if they are looking out for us, their wake is going to create waves that might cha create challenges us, for us. So watch out for power boats. Assume they don't see you. Best way to deal with this is to stay away from where power boats are going to be. Uh, this boat is out in the middle of a large lake. If I was paddling here, I would want to be much closer to shore where the power boat doesn't want to be. The boat, re the power boat requires uh, some water depth. I can paddle in two feet of water. It makes sense for me to stay where I'm comfortable and safe, and that allows the other boaters to have a good time in the water as well. So when we're paddling and we want to be seen, it is important for us to recognize that we are slow and small and we can be really hard to see. To improve our visibility, we wanna stay in a group and we can see a, a fairly large group here. We wanna wear high visibility colors. And again, these bright green life jackets really pop out against the background uh, in the area where I work. Bright colored paddles can also uh, pop out. So you can see this boater uh, well away from where I am. Their orange boat is pretty easy to see, but the bright yellow paddles really create high visibility against the trees in the background. That means it's easier for them to be avoided by other paddlers or other power boaters. And we, you can see that we chose to cross this area and we're, we're crossing a channel, a narrow point to get into the bay in the background. Um, but we can see that there's a power boat all the way into the background back here. Uh, so we chose to, to look out for that power boat. We let it cross in front of us. And when there was no other boat traffic around, we chose a narrow point, crossed in a group and got across uh, as quickly as possible. The next picture really helps emphasize that importance of visibility when we're on the water. Uh, and the picture, let me get my cursor again. This picture over here is of the two women right here. If you look at the woman in green here, my wife, you can see her, her green sleeves pop out brightly against the water and against the background. Her white paddle pops out and the blue life jacket is bright enough that it's easy to see against the background. Um, our friend is in a darker blue life jacket and even though her boat pops out, you can see that she is almost hidden against the background. And without that white hat, it might be harder to see her. So high visibility colors really make it easier for other boaters to see us. It makes it easier to find us if we capsize and we're in the water. So wear high visibility colors to prevent problems. And then the last hazard I want to wrap up with is transportation, because we often don't think about getting boats to and from the water is part of the hazards, um, but driving is a challenge and uh, putting boats onto a truck or trailer can be a challenge. Um, I have fallen off of this truck while standing on these boats, so uh, don't be like me. Make sure you don't fall when you're putting the boats up. Look out for traffic. We've got the road right here. Cars driving by might hit someone. We want to look out, uh, make sure that, that uh, we're safe. And we want to make sure that we secure the load on here. You can see that the boats are heavily strapped down. All of these boats are tied up at the, uh, the front of the bed of the truck. And you can see lines down here holding them in at the back. Uh, we're responsible for the loads that we put on our trucks and trailers. Make sure that we don't ruin somebody else's day after we've had a good day. So some take home messages. We want to identify problems, uh, take steps to prevent them, and then manage them if we have to. And some hazards we might deal with involve stuff that's going to happen to our bodies, dehydration, sunburn, and uh, muscle soreness, uh, features in the water, weather conditions, debris and things in the water, uh, other people, and transportation. Uh, there are a lot of other hazards. And uh, we did a, a presentation on paddling hazards in May, and you'll notice that I didn't talk about much of that in tonight's presentation, and we'll have some new material in our presentation next month. And with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing. All right, so thank you very much, Robin. Fantastic presentation. I'm glad you mentioned the accident timeline again. Um, throughout all of your uh, scenarios, I was thinking about, you know, what is the long before, the before, and just mm -hmm. before. Yeah. So that's excellent. 
All right. So if anybody has any questions or comments while we have Robin live, be happy to take them. For me, I was just wondering um, a little bit of a, a preview. I think you had mentioned um, next month you're going to touch on uh, cold water, cold water immersion. Yes, sir. Right. So, um, if you are watching live or you're watching the recording, when we have part two of paddling hazard, um, the paddling hazard series, um, just know it's not a repeat. It is a continuation of. Um, of paddling hazards it won't be it won't be a repeat of this tech yeah. talk and that'll be a deep dive into to cold water incapacitation cold shock hypothermia and uh, uh, circumrescue collapse wow okay fantastic um i guess i would ask a question that often comes up is um even for you know, someone that has has been on the water and basically trained, but, you know, just some resources for getting trained. We often say, you know, take training, but, mm -hmm. you know, beyond a generic sense, you know, where, where can we find some good in-person training? Right. So the, the easiest step for training is, is to start with reading. And the American Canoe Association, uh, if you look at their education webpage, uh, has a, a free online course that's about 30 minutes long that will, uh, will give an overview of basic safety concepts. And it's not intended to, to be an expert level class. It's intended to get somebody to the store and on the water safely and having some good first experiences. Uh, in terms of hands-on instruction, uh, there are you know, any Sea Scout ship uh, should be able to get access to some instruction. Uh, Boy Scout troops, summer camps are, are a great opportunity. And then the American Canoe Association's website and our affiliated instructors and clubs have tremendous paddling programs. Most of the clubs in the area that I, I uh, where I live have summer instructional programs. They have winter rolling programs to teach Ooh. people in a, a warm swimming pool how to roll their vessel. Um, and then you know, hands-on instruction throughout the paddling season. Um, so looking at, at your clubs, looking at the ACA's website, and then looking at, at local paddling stores, they often are a tremendous resource for, um, for local clubs and, and you know, local waterways and trips. Um, and then finally, there are, there are a number of national paddling schools. Uh, just Google learn to paddle and you'll, learn, you'll see all sorts of stuff online. All right, fantastic. Okay, I don't think there are any more questions coming in. So okay. I do want to thank you very much You're for welcome. the presentation tonight, Robin. Very much looking forward to part two of Paddling Hazards next month, September 27th. And we hope to see you all and more back here at 9 p.m. Eastern on September 27th. Have a good night, everyone. <laughs>